From hieroglyphs chiseled into limestone, to the invention of paper by the Chinese in 105 AD, to Gutenberg's movable type, to the pencil and the ballpoint pen, technology has changed and advanced the ways in which human beings communicate with the written word for as long as there has been a written word. The development of the personal computer in the 1970s and 1980s brought another great leap forward to the act of writing. But technological advancement wasn't limited to the personal computer alone. Sixty years ago, in July of 1961, IBM introduced its Selectric line of electric typewriters, and they changed the world. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, 75% of electric typewriters in the U.S. were Selectrics. So what was it that made the IBM Selectric so great? Thanks for your click, and welcome to Got Tech. Hey there, welcome back to episode three, and thank you so much for watching today. Please don't forget to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the little bell so that you can be notified when any new videos might pop up on the channel. I wanted to talk today about one of my favorite pieces of technology, and I know I've been saying that frequently over the last couple of episodes, but this is a real superstar. This is the IBM Selectric Electric Typewriter was introduced to the world 60 years ago next month, July of 1961. And it really helped to bridge the gap between the analog and digital worlds. Because we do think of IBM as a computing company, and of course, they became known as a computing company very, very early in the world of computing. But the Selectric had the ability to be used both in an analog fashion as a typewriter and in a digital fashion as connected to very early computers. And so we'll look at a couple of examples of that today in the first section. Now, most of you under the age of 40 or so only know of typewriters being used to scare someone or to kill them. But for most of us growing up in the 1970s and 1980s, even though many of us used personal computers, typewriters were still a part of our daily lives. And after I spent a little bit of time in the video going into my own IBM Selectric, I wanted to pose a question whether or not this piece of technology from the 1960s can do anything better than a piece of technology from 2021. And I think I found one thing that the Selectric can do better than my personal computer and this laser printer. So, Stay tuned for the end of the episode to figure out what that is. But for now, let's take a trip back to the late 1950s and early 1960s and look at the development of the IBM Selectric. Even by today's standards, the IBM Selectric, introduced in 1961, was a complete and total blockbuster. By the end of that year, 80,000 orders had been placed for this revolutionary machine, and nearly 25 million Selectrics were sold before the model was discontinued in 1986. But what was it that made the Selectric so great? It's beautiful. The team that designed the Selectric, led by an IBM engineer named Bud Beatty, was given permission to completely reinvent the typewriter. And they did exactly that implementing 2,800 parts in the machine, many of which they designed themselves. The most groundbreaking of these parts was the golf ball typing element, which introduced a completely different and quicker method of mechanical typing. The Selectric's golf balls were also interchangeable, allowing users to switch between a number of different typefaces, you'd know them as fonts today, with the flick of a tab. The Selectric was also an example of the great leap forward in IBM's industrial design. Elliot Noyes, an industrial designer and architect, made sure that the Selectric had curves, and the smoothness with which that golf ball nearly glided across the page was a key component of the Selectric's success. Although the unit itself was pretty heavy, it clocked in at nearly 40 pounds, it didn't take up a lot of space on a desk. These machines were built to last. 
But as I mentioned in the introduction, the Selectric wasn't used for typing alone. The Selectric was also used in offices as part of IBM's MAG card system. This system, which allowed users to use the Selectric as both an input and output device by storing information on magnetic cards, was advertised by IBM back in 1969 as one heck of a time saver. The MAG card Selectric does the rest at 150 words a minute. I'm free to do something else. That's the big plus. With less pressure and more help from her typewriter, Jane can do a better job. There's less pressure on us, too. What comes out of the typewriter is a draft. We don't have to be afraid to change it. I left the office on time, and so did everybody else. We're all a little more relaxed than we used to be and a little more efficient. The Selectric also played an incredibly important role in IBM's early computer terminals. Its chassis provided the basis for the keyboard input of the IBM System 360, which, according to IBM, enabled a wider range of engineers and researchers to begin talking to and interacting with their computers. You can even see the Selectric being used as an input device for an RCA computer, in this video about computing at the Pentagon, released by the U.S. government in the 1960s. All right, folks, so here it is. This is the IBM Selectric. This is my own personal model. And the story of how this got to me is actually kind of interesting. A parent of one of my students was a typewriter collector. She ended up with like 450 or 500 different vintage typewriters. And so in order to start divesting of her collection. She opened up a typewriter store in the town where I work and she made appointments with people who came in and were mostly interested in the mechanical typewriters of the 1950s and 60s, the Olivetti's and stuff like that. In any case, she mostly owned mechanical typewriters, but she did own a couple of uh, these, uh, these electric typewriters, particularly a couple of Selectrics. And she actually uh, lent me one from my classroom on sort of a, a long-term loan. And then when I told her that I loved it so much and that it was my favorite thing in the world, she said, well, I'll just give it to you. So the first thing that I wanna point out to you about this typewriter is the sound that it makes when you hit the keys. And I'm going to just type The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, and you hear, even through this inexpensive lavalier mic, you hear the incredible sound that this makes. I wish I could describe to you with words the feel of typing on an IBM Selectric. If you've never typed on one before in your life, you really have to try it. There are a lot of computer keyboards nowadays that are made to feel more tactile, to feel more like this kind of uh, spring-loaded typing situation, but it really is the difference between uh, driving an old school car with no power steering and driving something with power steering. There's this amazing power assist that happens that is just incredible. Uh, Now this one does not have the correction tape. I think that was an IBM Selectric 2 only situation. But when I open up the actual top here and show you the inside, you will see just how this thing works and just how incredible this is. I also wanna show you a little bit about the globes that uh, can be used and interchanged to provide different typefaces. All right, now I will get a little bit closer, but as I turn this on, you can see right down here, there's a belt, I'm not gonna to touch it obviously, uh, but there's a belt that drives this entire thing. These belts can get a little bit finicky. Actually, when I brought this thing out of storage, it had been there for a year, and I don't think I'd probably used it uh, for more than that, maybe 18 or 20 months. The belt does get a little stuck, so just a little bit of lubrication on that belt uh, and things work great. And this actually is an IBM belt. So again, these things are fixable, they are restorable, and they can be made new. Uh, as you can see over here, this is the spool where the uh, new, uh, the ribbon rather, this is the new ink here on the left side, and then the uh, the I don't know, the waste ink or the, the already used spool 
on the right side, and I'll show you a couple of close-ups of this because I really like the way that it uses uh, sort of two tracks, if you will, of the spool. Uh, now, when I think about the way that this globe moves, I want you to just look at it as I hit the shift button here, or as I hit the caps lock button, and I'll show you a couple of these globes, and I'll try to get an even more of an up-close shot here about this. But the globe is just a remarkable advancement in the typewriter. And uh, let me show you a little bit what that looks like. I'm going to shut up now because I can't uh, type and talk at the same time. Uh, but just check out the way that this globe does its globe thing. It's just the way that it moves. Oh, there's a typo there. The way that it moves, the way that it allows you to type as quickly as you possibly can is really something. And again, the satisfying tactile nature of this machine cannot be overstated. Like if you've never used one of these, as I said uh, just a moment ago, you really should try to get your hands on one because they are so cool. They are so much fun. They are so interesting. All right, so we're a little bit closer to the globe now, and it's a little tricky for me to type here, so I'm probably gonna make a ton of typos, but just this gives you a better idea of what we're actually looking at. And again, just how quickly and beautifully this thing moves. So again, I can't really talk and type at the same time. Oops. dedicated to the proposition, oops, that all men are. So it's just so much fun to watch and I'll, I'll get another uh, couple of close-ups. Let me take the camera off the tripod and just get another couple of close-ups for you of just this whole interior working. All right, so again, you can see this whole setup there. We've got the belt going on underneath there. And just looking at the ways in which these little, they're almost like piano keys, uh, the way that they draw this carriage across. You can see the little teeth there where the margin settings are. Let me set this margin, this end margin here a little bit so you can hear the ding, hopefully. It'll ding, there we go. And of course, this does not have an automatic carriage return computer users of 2021. So when you heard that ding, you knew that you had to hit the return key in order to go on to the next line. And then of course, the last thing before I leave the globes behind and show you a couple of still pictures of the inside of the machine is to actually show you a little bit more about these globes. So they come in these really great little plastic cases. And the idea for the globe is that the, each globe is going to give you a different typeface and a different point size. So this, for example, is a letter Gothic at 12 point. This is Artisan at 12 point. This is Manifold 72 at 10 point. And I've got the sort of standard on here, which is, of course, Prestige Elite 72 at 12 point. Now notice how these things go on. There's a little tab here that clicks up and then the globe fits right onto this little uh, piece right here. And then you simply close the tab and snap it into place to lock it in. So here's my letter Gothic 12, tab goes open, right on the top there, snap into place to lock. And then all you need to do is grab a new sheet of paper well, you want to close the cover first, turn the typewriter on. You can manually advance, of course, with the wheel here, or you can use the return key. And once you've done all that, you are ready to type.
Okay, so I'm going to try to do something pretty straightforward here, and this is not something that I do frequently, so I'm sure that if I did it more often, I would have a better system for it. But I'm going to try to print an envelope. So I'm going to try to print this out with my return address up here in the left-hand corner and the recipient address here in the middle. Uh, I tried to do this first through Google Docs, but Google Docs does not have a built-in envelope template. I then switched to Microsoft Word, but my organization's account apparently doesn't allow me to create documents on a Mac, which is weird. So I'm now in step three, which is pages here, which should allow me to create documents in a Mac. So let's throw a timer up on the screen and see how long this takes. Okay, so the first problem here is that because I don't print envelopes with any frequency, I always forget the size of the envelope that I'm printing. And I'm usually just printing those, you know, regular envelopes that we send letters in. Is it a 10? Is it a 12? Is it a Monarch? Is it a Pelican? I don't know what it is. So, of course, um, when you don't know what it is, you have to figure it out. So I had to go and get my trusty tape measure and actually measure the envelope, which was uh, a bit of an annoying task. But anyway, once I figured out what kind of envelope I had, I could then create the addresses here on pages and then hit the print command. Now here's the other problem, of course, because I don't do this frequently. How does the envelope go in the feeder again? I have no idea. I'm gonna put it here uh, backside up with the flap facing to the left. Uh, but obviously that was not the correct way to do it. And it actually took me three tries before I finally figured it out. Now this is not a particularly compelling amount of time. I've spent less time in line at the DMV. So let's see how the typewriter does it. Five minutes, 28 seconds for the computer and 40 seconds for the 1960s typewriter. Yeah, there's obviously a clear winner here. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me today for this look at the vintage IBM Selectric typewriter. If you've enjoyed this video, please make sure to like it and share it with your friends. I look forward to seeing you soon. I think my next video is going to be about a calculator. So if that sort of thing is up your alley, make sure to turn on those notifications. Otherwise, Stay safe, be well, and I'll see you next time.